Hey, good morning, physics. How are you doing? Well, maybe it's not morning where you are, but it is here. Uh, we are here talking about Newton's laws, and we're going to introduce the concept of forces today. Um, so I couldn't resist this little uh, screenshot of Luke using the force and Newton telling him to use a real force. Uh, but anyway, just my little tie-in to uh, Star Wars, because you can't use the word force without thinking about Star Wars, right? Anyway. Uh, we're going to jump in here to, uh, to our next little section of the, of the textbook. Um, first of all, we need to define the word force. And as, it is not, as Obi-Wan Kenobi said, an invisible energy field surrounding everything. It is, in fact, a, uh, a push or a pull impulse on an object. Um, and so it, it, a force is something that can potentially change the motion state uh, of an object. And that's tied to the concept of inertia, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, forces can be balanced, and if forces are balanced, then the object does not change its motion. So if something is, uh, is moving along a, a road and the engine is pushing forward with exactly the same amount of force as wind resistance and friction on the moving parts is pushing backwards, then the car moves at a constant speed and you're not actually accelerating, you're just moving. Um, but you can also have unbalanced forces in that ex same example. If you push harder on the accelerator, the engine works more, and then the engine overcomes air resistance and friction of moving parts, and now you go faster. So a force is an object, sorry, is a, an impulse that can potentially change the state of motion of an object. Okay, it can start it moving or stop it moving or make it move in a different direction or make it move faster. Okay, so that's, that's an example of a force. Um, and then there are different kinds of forces. There are what we call contact forces and what we call field forces. Contact forces are things that happen when you touch something. Field forces are, are forces that can be applied to an object without physical contact. So, um, we have different kinds of contact forces. There's tension forces, which are a pull. Um, so if you swing on a swing, you are providing tension on the chain, okay? The chain is in tension, that's a pull force. Um, there are compression forces where you push on things like crushing a can or you standing on the ground as a compression force on the floor. Um, torsion is a twist, so this would be like, uh, I don't know, opening a can of, of tuna, and you put that torsion force on the handle of the can opener, and it does its job. Um, a shear would be a sliding force, where you move part of, the, of an object one direction and part of an object the other direction. A pair of scissors is a perfect example of shearing forces. That's why sometimes they're called shears. There you go. Uh, and then a friction is any force that resists motion. So um, that happens with air with moving objects or water with objects that move through it, or even your feet on the ground. Um, friction is a force that resists movement. Uh, just a, a quick picture where we can identify some forces. This is the Erasmus Bruch, a very famous bridge in Rotterdam, Holland, and I have family members that live in that building right there, so I have seen this bridge um, up close and personal a number of times. Uh, but the, uh, that bridge in Rotterdam, Holland, we can see some examples of different kinds of forces. All of the weight of this road is suspended on cables to this very large A-frame, which is counterbalanced by some steel poles that go back into the ground down here. So these have a lot of tension on them. They're holding up the weight of this bridge. Um, and this also has tension on it, okay? This A-frame has a lot of compression force. The weight of the A-frame and all of the weight of the bridge is transferred to this A-frame. So down here, lots of compression as it stands there and holds the weight of the bridge. Um, and then there, uh, there are shear forces. When the wind blows across this thing, then the, uh, sometimes the cables vibrate a little bit. You can hear it kind of singing as the wind goes through. And that's because the cable is getting rocked back and forth by the shear forces of the wind. Um, not a lot of torsion here. If it starts to twist, these kinds of bridges are in trouble. Um, but uh, very few things we can imagine would cause it to twist. But um, other forces are definitely visible here in this bridge. Um, this is another example of forces at work in our friend the dinosaur here. 
Um, there's a weight, which we're going to get to in a little bit, is a is a compression force against the ground. Um, you could identify forces uh, that resist his motion through the air. That would be a uh, force of friction. Um, buoyancy is a is a uh, another kind of force where it's being pushed up by the air around him. Um, and then he doesn't actually move with his tail, but propulsion, the force that moves him forward, would be uh, would be some kind of contact force on the ground, right? So contact forces all around us. There's also field forces. Field forces do not have to have direct contact to physical objects in order to be experienced. Um, so some examples of those are gravity. You don't have to be touching the ground for you to go downward. And that's a good idea. That's a good thing because if you had to be in contact with the ground to be stuck to the ground, then jumping would be dangerous for your life. Uh, you might drift up into the atmosphere, and that would be a problem. So gravity is not a contact force. It works at a distance. The electromagnetic force also works at a distance. Um, things are attracted to each other because of opposite magnetic or electric poles, and that can happen without physical contact. The strong and weak nuclear forces are also field forces. They're the things that hold the nucleus of the atom together. And uh, we'll get more into those when we talk about nuclear physics uh, later on in the chapter or not the chapter, in the book, later than the year. Um, here's some more examples of those field forces. Gravity with the famous apple that never actually hit Isaac Newton on his head, but that's how it's always drawn. The strong and weak mag and nuclear forces, which again we'll get to later, and electromagnetism. Um, these are the four fundamental interactions of nature, and pretty much everything can be explained by these forces. So uh, that's pretty cool. Another example where we can find some forces. This is somebody wringing out a rag, and uh, on the individual fibers of this rag, there is tension because as you twist it, the fibers get tighter and they pull. So the individual fibers of this rag are experiencing tension. Um, the spaces between them where the water molecules are sitting are getting compressed, and that's why the water leaves, right? So there's tension and compression. Obviously, torsion as the rag is being twisted is what's causing both the compression and the tension. It's, it's ultimately a torsion force here. Um, there is some friction in the uh, fibers of the rag as they move past each other. Um, there is some resistance to being twisted, okay? Um, and then as the water is squeezed out, you can see gravity working as the water falls into the bucket. And the water stays in little droplets as it falls um, partly because of its own gravity, which is cool to think about, and partly because of electromagnetic interactions of the water molecules, as they like to be sitting close to them, close to themselves, close to one another. Um, so they form droplets as it falls. So here you have lots and lots of pictures of forces, all in one fairly simple diagram. Okay, so forces. Um, now that we know what a force is, let's look into Newton's laws of forces. Um, what did he determine is the, uh, is the nature of forces and how they move. First, we need to talk about inertia. And this idea is, uh, oops, this idea is often called Newton's first law, even though it's actually Galileo who came up with this concept. Newton just supplied the math to prove it. But um, the wording actually didn't change between Galileo's statement and Newton's statement. It's just that at Galileo's time, we didn't know why. And uh, by Newton's time, he could do the math to show it. Okay, So he really proved the law as opposed to discovered the law. Uh, but a, the first law, the law of inertia, is that a system at rest will stay at rest, and a system in motion will stay in constant straight-line motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. So uh, if something is moving, it stays moving unless something acts on it. If something is at rest, it stays at rest unless something acts on it. Now in our real world experiences, we don't see moving things keep moving forever because we live in a world of friction and eventually things slow down and stop. But the reason it slowed down and stopped is not because motion runs out, but it's because an unbalanced force, the friction that resists motion, acted on the object. Okay, in a frictionless environment, things do go moving on forever and ever and ever. And I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. Um, so, a force is not needed to keep an object in motion, only to accelerate it. And acceleration can be speeding up, slowing down. It can also be turning it, 
changing its direction. Okay. Uh, systems not being accelerated are in a state called a mechanical e equilibrium. So if something is sitting there stationary, it's in equilibrium. If something is moving at a constant rate of speed and not changing direction or velocity, then it's in equilibrium. Okay. Some examples of these things. Here we have uh, here we have a rock that is sitting still and has been since 1620. This is Plymouth Rock. This is the rock that the uh, the pilgrims set up as a monument to their arrival in the new land. And uh, it's been sitting there. Well, I'm sure they moved it temporarily when they built the monument around it. But that is the rock that has been sitting there for a long time. All the balanced forces are balanced and it doesn't move. Okay, it's a mechanical equilibrium. Um, I keep doing that. This is fun. Uh, this is a diagram of our solar system and four deep space probes that we have sent out from our solar system, Pioneer 10 and 11, and Voyager 1 and 2. Um, and these, these probes are moving at a constant rate of speed, um, and they will keep moving, in theory, forever, because there is nothing to slow them down. Now, if eventually they run into a, a, a planetoid or they run into an asteroid, it, or a comet, then obviously their course will change or they'll get destroyed or they'll be done. But until such time as that happens, they're going to keep moving forever. These were all launched in the 70s. They are all now outside of the orbit of Pluto. They're outside of our what we recognize as our solar system. Um, and they are going to just keep traveling through space in a straight line, in theory, until the Lord destroys the universe. Um, so this is an example of an object in mechanical equilibrium moving at a constant rate of speed, no acceleration. In contrast to that, this man's face <laughs> and this hockey puck are being accelerated. They are experiencing a force and their direction is changing. Um, and so those are, that's just an example of objects that are in mechanical equilibri equilibrium and objects that are not. So Newton's second law uh, talks about that the acceleration of a system is directly proportional to the sum of the forces acting on the system and is in the same direction as the resultant. So if you have several forces on one object, that object is going to be accelerated in the direction of the resultant forces. Now, if all the forces balance each other, so there's no resultant, then obviously there's no acceleration. Uh, but if there is a resultant vector, then the object is going to be accelerated in that direction. Okay, and the formula for that is F equals MA. That is the mother formula for mechanics. Um, you will be doing that, that little operation so many times to make your head spin. So become good friends with F equals MA. That's force equals mass times acceleration. So the mass of an object in kilograms will be accelerated in meters per second um, at a certain rate depending on the force in newtons that is being applied to that object. Okay, so mass times acceleration is force. You can rearrange that to solve for any of the variables if you want to say, hey, I apply a force and I get this acceleration, what's the mass? Then you could rearrange the formula to solve for m, um, or you could rearrange the formula to solve for a. So however you wanted to rearrange that. But if you memorize f equals ma, you will be well served. Okay. Um, be sure to sum all the forces on an object before you try to calculate the acceleration. Otherwise, you're going to have acceleration vectors going all different places. It's much easier to sum the forces first and then use that resultant vector once for f equals ma. Okay, uh, some pictures for you. The uh, the images here we have we have uh, an accelerator on a car. Obviously, we've already talked about that. You are increasing the force going in the in the forward direction usually if you're in drive, and so an increased force in that direction will accelerate the car in that direction, which is why we call it an accelerator. Um, interestingly, in, in a perfect mechanical world, an ideal uh, physics world where there is no friction, you wouldn't need to have your foot on the accelerator to keep going the constant speed because your car would just roll along the freeway at a constant speed without being accelerated. However, there's always wind resistance and there's friction in every moving part of the car. So you always have to be applying some force to move the car forward, even at a constant rate. Um, because we don't live in an ideal world. Um, same concept here with this boat. We have lots of big full sails where the wind is applying a force to the boat and the boat is moving through the water. The boat is being accelerated in this direction 
Um, and if it is at a constant rate of speed, even though its sails are full, that's because there are other forces pushing backwards on the boat, the friction of the water and things of that nature. And so uh, we're, we're trying to achieve forward direction uh, and keep it going in a constant forward direction. We have to always be applying enough force to the sails to overcome the force of friction. And again, it's the sum of the forces on an object. So we'd have to consider the forward force and the reverse force on the boat um, to analyze whether or not it's, it's actually being accelerated or if it's just moving in a constant direction, constant speed. This um, is a race car braking, and you can see how hot the brakes get on this uh, Ferrari as it's coming around the corner. Less heat, but still heat in the back. Um, and this car is breaking into a corner and you see that this force being applied here is accelerating the car. Not accelerating to make it go faster, but accelerating it in a negative direction so that it is slowing the car down. Okay, these are all examples of force, mass, and acceleration. Um, uh, we've got another one here. Two boys pulling on a rock tied to a rope. This boy can pull his a lot easier than this one. Um, this one has a lot more mass, and so it takes more force to accelerate it across the table. This one much less mass, so a smaller force can accelerate it across the table. And of course, the young lady here is fawning after the boy who can pull the big rock, because, I don't know, he must be studly in some way. There you go. I did say studly in a lecture. Newton's laws and forces. Uh, the third law, if a system exerts a force on another system, then the second system exerts a force in the same magnitude on the first system, but in the opposite direction. So this is a little bit complicated. This has been summarized as every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And that is true, but if you start to analyze it too much, it gets really confusing really fast. We have to think of whole systems, not individual parts, um, because if you if you don't understand this, you're going to get confused as to why anything moves because you're going to say, well, that force is balanced by another force. Um, and when we when we analyze this in detail, you need to look at a system and say, what is the system doing? The system is applying a force in this direction. There is another mirrored force, but we don't always care about the mirrored force because it may not be affecting our system. Okay, uh, we'll explain this a little bit later, but I'll give you several examples and hopefully it makes sense to you. Um, often these forces are called action-reaction pairs. So you do something and the uh, other system responds. We care about forces inside a system, not about forces acting on a different system. So not every force is balanced in the system that we are considering. Every force is balanced, but sometimes we ignore the reaction force because of what we're looking at in physics. Okay, so here's some examples. Uh, two people push really hard and they are going to accelerate a, a, apart from each other. They're, I guess, standing on ice or something like that and they can push each other away. And this person's push is the same as this person, person's push. Even if this person feels like they're pushing harder than this person is pushing, the sum of the forces are balanced in that situation. Okay, same thing here on this rope. You can see it really easily. This person pulls on the rope, this person pulls on the rope. Um, and the rope has a certain amount of tension. And the tension that it feels is the uh, same on both sides of the rope. The rope can't be more tense over here and slack over here. Okay, same idea here. Um, if a wing pushes air downward, then the air pushes the bird up. So Every action has an equal and opposite reaction, and this one will become more clear to you with practice. All right. Um, so after we have talked about Newton's three laws, the last thing we need to discuss is weight and mass. When I've already said this in an, earlier, in an earlier lecture, mass is best understood as the ability of an object to resist a change in its inertia. Um, if I'm running at you and you want to make me not hit you, You've got to apply a certain amount of force to either stop me or turn me. And it's harder to stop me from tackling you than it is to stop a chihuahua from tackling you. Because the chihuahua, while he thinks he's big and nasty in his own mind, he actually in truth is not. And a very small amount of force can stop or steer him away. But uh, a big dude like me is going to have a lot more inertia and I'm going to be much harder to turn or stop. That is why we know that I have more mass. Now, on the Earth, 
a Chihuahua and I weigh different amounts. And so you can analyze mass that way as well, as long as there's gravity. But I weigh less on the moon than I do here because the moon's gravity is less. I don't have less mass. It's just that the weight is a little bit different. And a Chihuahua and I have different mass now. But if we were both floating in space, we would have zero mass, I mean, zero weight, uh, both of us. And so weight and mass do not always uh, line up, okay? All matter has mass, not all matter has weight, which is only measured as a force of gravity acting on mass. So again, our F equals MA, we can swap it out a little bit to say the force of weight, which is how much you weigh, right, is equal to the mass of an object times the force of gravity which for this class is going to be 9.81 meters per second squared. So how, what is my mass? Multiply it by the, the acceleration of gravity, and that'll tell you how many newtons of force I am exerting on the ground, and that's my weight. Um, when we measure something in the English unit and we say pounds, it's actually just an abbreviation of foot pounds, which is the same kind of idea as a newton. It's a measure of force and distance, just like a, a newton is the measure of uh, mass and acceleration, okay? So um, we need to keep those things in mind. Weight or mass are different things. So a quick picture to show that. Um, two astronauts, Buzz and Neil, on the moon, and, and Buzz says, Neil, I've lost so much mass since coming to space. And Buzz says, no, you didn't lose mass. You're on the moon, silly man. You've lost weight, but not mass, okay? Here's another example of a, the same amount of mass being uh, experienced as differing amounts of weight. If you're in an elevator that is either stationary or moving at a constant speed, then you are what you are as far as your weight on the earth goes. But when the, when the uh, elevator is accelerated upward rapidly, you weigh a little bit more because of the force interactions between you and the elevator. Um, and if the elevator were dropping uh, quickly, then you would weigh a little bit less because of your force interactions with the elevator. And should the cable snap, just before you die, um, you will be weightless. So you can say, yeah, isn't this fun? And then you're done. Uh, so <laughs> there's that. Another quick example, we started with Star Wars. I'm going to end with Star Wars. Uh, just as we talk about mass and weight, the Death Star and a Star Destroyer and TIE Fighters all have different amounts of mass. These are small. This is large. This is super big. But... In space, they all weigh nothing. They all weigh nothing because there's no gravity acting on these things. You can't hold a scale up to the ship and see how much it weighs, right? But these guys can turn, I speak as if they exist. These fictitious things can turn and stop and maneuver much more easily than the Star Destroyer and much more easily than the Death Star. So uh, it's easier to change the direction or the momentum, the inertia of this object than it is to change the inertia of this object. And even though they're both weightless, this has much more mass. Okay? Weight and mass are not the same thing. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments field below, and I'll get to it as soon as I can. And otherwise, I will see you tomorrow. God bless you.